you need it. No, I have Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. My name is Attila Erdős. Uh, I'm the head of the international office. And uh, today, on behalf of the Faculty of Special Needs Education, it's my great pleasure to welcome Mr. Kor Meyer, the director of the European Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education. Uh, first of all, I would like on, I, I would like to express our special thanks to Mr. Mayer for accepting our invitation and visiting our faculty during his very busy schedule in Budapest. So, Mr. Mayer will deliver a roughly 45-50 minute long uh, presentation about the agency, about its uh, policy, about its history and, and main activities. Of course, after the uh, presentation, there will be time to, for questions and comments, so don't hesitate to ask Mr. Mayer after the presentation. But before we start uh, the program today, I would like to give you a very short introduction of Mr. Mayer. I have to use my paper. <clears throat> so Mr. Mayer has been the director of the agency since 2005. Uh, he holds a PhD in social sciences based on a study of factors and processes influencing high referral rates to special schools in Netherlands. He has a research background focused on comparative studies on inclu inclusive education in international perspective. <clears throat> he has acted as, as consultant on special needs issues to the OECD and other national and international bodies for ex like uh, European Un Union or UNESCO. In his former position as staff mem member of the agency, he was responsible for European-wide projects, such as special provision and inclusion in Europe, financing of special needs and inclusive education in Europe, and classroom practice studies. Uh, recently, Mr. Mayer completed a chapter in the Handbook of Inclusion and Diversity in Education, and this year, <coughs> Mr. Mayer published, together with Amanta Watkins, an article, Financing Special Needs and Inclusive Education from Salamanca to the Present in the International Journal of Inclusive Education. I hope I mentioned every important point. OK, <laughs> thank you. So, uh, before, uh, so I would like to give the floor to Mr. Mayer to deliver his presentation, and after that, we will come back with questions and comments. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, please. Hello, hello. Yeah. Thank you for your kind words uh, to introduce me like that. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation of being here with you. I, uh, I'm not sure if you all can see me, but I'm quite tall, maybe. That helps a bit. Um, thank you for having me here today at this uh, university. I have, I have some difficulties with the Hungarian language, but I think it's the Utfush Laurent University in Budapest. And um, I, I, I love to come to Hungary. This, I think this is my fifth or sixth time in the past. We've been here a lot, uh, in, also with our work. Uh, as I said, I'm Cor Meyer. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, I work in Denmark and in Brussels, and I travel throughout Europe and outside Europe a lot. Uh, just to give you a short summary of my past travels, I've been in Cali, Colombia, 
a few weeks ago where there was a world conference of the UNESCO talking about sustainable development goal number four, which is on inclusive education and equity uh, as the main topics. And after that, I've been in Madrid, and I've been in Denmark, and I've been in Belgium, and next week I'm in Rome, and the week thereafter I'm in Frankfurt, and the week thereafter I'm in uh, Denmark, and then I go to Iceland, and so then I have you a bit of a picture that I'm more European than Netherlands, although I'm from Groningen, as I said, and there is a student here also from my own University of Groningen, which shows how small the world is, isn't it? Uh, she studied at the same university where I studied, but where I also gave lessons. Uh, my background is uh, research, as said, but I have done orthopedagogics, that is special pedagogics at the University of Groningen, but my interest went to data and to research, so I also ended up uh, giving lessons in methodology, research, uh, data, statistics, uh, math. So if any of you have problems with math, please uh, approach me and I will try to help you after this uh, and, I, and for free. But it's only five minutes because I have to leave at 11. <laughs> <laughs> I have to leave at 11. Uh, my flight is at 12.50, so we really uh, have to stop at, at 10 to 11 or something. Um, uh, as I said, uh, our office, main office is in Denmark, in Odense. Uh, that is the place where uh, a lot of uh, what do you say, fairy tales started. Uh, I don't know if you know the place Odense. They don't say Odense as we used to say. They swallow the D in Denmark. They say Odense. The day has disappeared somehow. Uh, the Danish are very uh, easy with... Uh, characters in their, in their sentences. And Odense is the, is the place where Hans Christian Andersen uh, was, uh, lived and, and wrote his fairy tales. And one of the fairy tales out of Odense is this European agency that started actually in Denmark. Uh, it, it, it made the impossible, we thought, was made possible throughout the years. Um, I brought a lot of slides with me uh, today, too many. Uh, well, I skip a few. We already skipped a few f before I even started because of uh, uh, links that didn't work, hyperlinks, and so on. Um, my voice is used a lot the past days. We had our biannual meeting. We, every year we have two uh, meetings with all our countries, and we have 31 member countries. And from every country, we have a representative board member who is from the ministry. And for Hungary, that's Laszlo Kisch from the Ministry of Education. And Andrea Pelus, who is sitting here, she is the national coordinator for Hungary in our organization. And that is also your vice dean of uh, this department. Uh, and Andrea is very um, good in, in trying to get people to speak at, at uh, situations like this, because when she approached me, I said, Andrea, I, I've been traveling so much, and, and then we had this biannual meeting with all our countries, which is, and I'm, I'm more or less responsible for everything, uh, not only practicalities, but also content and budget and uh, how smooth the meetings go. Uh, that I said, Andrea, it's not a, not a very good idea that I speak, I lost my voice probably by that time, I'm that tired, and she said, yeah, okay, and? <laughs> and then I said, well, I can, think of, I can think of asking a staff member too. She said, no, you should come. And then uh, with her smile, I couldn't resist. Uh, <laughs> so I'm happy to be here. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not fed up or something else. I'm really happy to be here with you. But I need a, a, a bit of water now and then. Okay, uh, I have a lot of slides, you can have them, uh, no problem afterwards. So you don't need to make pictures or uh, try to catch up with the content of it. So I start with a few uh, introductory words about our agency, might be a bit, uh, I might skip a few as I said. But we are not e uh, EU, uh, we are independent. I think that uh, that's important to start with. We are totally independent from the, um, and we make our own decisions and our own uh, plans and, and we act as a platform for collaboration for ministries of education in our member countries. And what we, our plan is to improve their uh, education policy and practice for all learners. 
um, I think I should start with this all learners. So we are not only focusing on special needs. We, uh, our uh, philosophy is that the quality of all learners is at stake, and that includes children with disadvantages, migrant, uh, talented and gifted, the whole spectrum of um, needs. And, and I think to start with, I want to make clear that we all differ. Uh, and, and it is problematic to say to a person, you differ a bit too much, so you don't belong to us. You should go elsewhere. And that is the, 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 the thesis that we fight. We, our basic assumption is that we all differ and we are all equal. Um, right, so to uh, emphasize this again, is that all learners of any age, that is our vision, should be provided with meaningful, high-quality education in their local community alongside their peers, uh, and not uh, to segregate them as, as in many situations happens. Have a look at our website, then you see this movie, which uh, in the, you can then quickly see our aim and philosophy. Um, we divide three main uh, levels that should be taken uh, care of when talking about inclusive education. That is legislation, of course, and that in legislation should be clear on uh, the goal of uh, inclusive education and, and uh, uh, equitable educational opportunities. And then there should be a clear policy, uh, which uh, is not only for educators, but all decision makers who are all the stakeholders in the uh, um, situation. And then, of course, operational structures and processes. Um, the Council recommendations of, of 22nd of May uh, last year were, uh, and that's from the Council of Europe, was very strong on the area of inclusive education as one of its main priorities of the uh, EU. And, and we were very happy that they mentioned us in the counter resolution, in the recommendation, by saying make effective use of this agency because they have the knowledge and uh, they, uh, if you need help, please approach this European agency. Now, I think that I should add here that our um, focus is, in our organization, we have left the discussion what is inclusive education exactly and we have also left the debate, we skipped the debate, why is it needed? Our focus is how can you implement inclusive education? So the, uh, in many countries, people would like to spend hours de debating what inclusive education exactly is and definitions and uh, conceptual frameworks and operational frameworks. We, we said, let's now look at the how of inclusive education. And I hope to inform you about that and if you have any questions, I'm happy to elaborate on that. So we um, are in line with international uh, important statements and uh, the agency is uh, looking for evidence-based information and recommendations. So we brought some documents with you, for you, with us, and uh, please take them. I can add directly if you are interested in a very specific topic and we have published uh, it, we you can order it through the website and we send it to you for free, printed. You can also download it. We have all our uh, summary reports in all the 21 or 22 languages that we translate into. So in Hungarian, they are available in summary reports. And also those, if you, you can download them, which is probably easier, but if you want a printed version, we, we send it to you. So. Um, evidence-based information and recommendations, and we combine, we are not only looking at policy, but also in research and practice. We all try to combine those three um, parts of the, of the debate. And uh, uh, we try to create a platform for peer learning. Uh, what we don't want to do is to compare countries too much. We, we are not a Eurovision Song Contest and, and say, um, Pays-Bas, 12 points, or uh, Luxembourg, uh, six, uh, zero points, or the other way around. Uh, what we try to do is learning from each other. Uh, so uh, I, we think that the best way of 
improving things is, is to learn from each other, look over each other's shoulder. Also for teachers, I think that is something that has been neglected uh, a lot in, in many classroom practices, that uh, looking over a shoulder of another teacher learns you much more than reading a book or go to a conference or go to a presentation like this. Uh, it's by learning, by looking and, and opening your classroom and say, okay, uh, that's, that I should keep in mind. So the, the, the two-teacher system is a very uh, interesting uh, uh, methodology in, in classroom practices. I come back to that maybe later. Uh, we work with a multi-annual work program from six, uh, seven years, and um, we are uh, very happy that uh, uh, that um, our funding, I will say a few words more about that, comes from member countries, so they pay the contribution, the 31 member countries, plus uh, the, we have a special position in the Jean Monnet program uh, under the Erasmus Plus uh, program. We are one of the uh, seven centers of excellence in Europe who get a grant from the EU which is very, very uh, unique because that's not the way that the EU would like to support institutions uh, because there's competition and there should be uh, an open market and so on, so, but we have a special position in that. So all our activities uh, are in line with the European Council priorities, but also, and I think that's an important uh, uh, point to mention, with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, um, the um, UN Convention, I don't know if you've read it or seen it, but Article 24 is a very strong article and that says all children should be educated in, in an inclusive setting. Where, no, no debate about where or how, or, but they should be debated in an inclusive setting at all ages. And Hungary ratified the UN Convention in, I think, Sorry? We were the second. The second in 2008? So, Hungary re ratified the UN Convention in 2007 and uh, also ratified Article 24, which says that all children should be educated in the mainstream uh, inclusive setting. And of course, uh, you can minister sign everything all day and then they say yes and then it goes uh, into a shelf or something but the ratification is done by parliament so that makes it stronger than any other agreement between countries the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities have a look at article 24 uh, these are our member countries uh, oh I look at the wrong side yes that this is an overview of our member countries as said 31 um, here you see the list of our member countries. Belgium is uh, represented by the Flemish and French community. In the UK also by different parts of England, of uh, Great Britain, England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. As you can see, we also have Serbia as a member who is not EU. Also Switzerland, Norway, Iceland are not EU, but there are uh, agreements. So our agency is European, basically. Um, 31 member countries. We just had our biannual meeting with all the ministries this week. This I skip. Um, we s uh, have a, seen a bit of a development in our agency in the first period. We are not so old, by the way. We started in 1996, which is uh, well, 20 something years ago. We started with all kinds of projects and, and developed our knowledge, and then there came a phase that we uh, did more things than only knowledge building. We gave consultancy and advice to ministries and, and uh, other stakeholders. And um, one of the things that we did in that phase, for instance, we also did audits in, in countries. So we went, for instance, to Iceland and Malta where the ministry, uh, minister asked us, have a look at our policy and practice and give your view on that. So we were more in the, in the uh, way to change things and to give uh, recommendations about change in countries. And that is the phase we are now also in. Uh, we are now an active, change, active agent for policy change. What we want to do is look at policies of member countries and say, well, uh, 
this could be done in another way, which is more in line with <coughs> the UN Convention and, and European uh, Council resolutions. Uh, so these are our member countries, and then I go to uh, the finance I already did. Uh, we have uh, already mentioned that we have an operating grant from the Commission Erasmus Plus program. Then a bit of our work, um, <clears throat> as I said, thematic projects. We brought some materials. One of the th recent one is the evidence uh, of the link between inclusive education and social inclusion, because we can talk inclusive education and, and think that's good, or uh, but we also want to know has it any relation later on to chances on the labor market or uh, independent living or social life or further education and so on and so forth. And the evidence is described in this short summary. We brought the uh, English version, but as I said on the web, you find also the Hungarian uh, translation of it. If it's already there, I think so. Yeah. Um, so we do thematic projects on various areas uh, from uh, early childhood intervention to uh, transition questions and so on. Uh, one of the <coughs> recent initiatives we do is the country policy review and analysis. Is we and Hungary is involved was involved in that one too, to look at the uh, legislation and uh, policy and to give feedback about um, how the policy and legislation is constructed. And therefore, we use what we call the PIC model. Model P is prevention. E, I is intervention, and C is compensation. And of course, if uh, legislation has a lot of compensatory uh, interventions, that is less good than if legislation is a lot focused on prevention uh, in, in, in their legislation. So we give feedback to countries where they are in terms of prevention, intervention, and, and compensation in their legislation. We also have a, a huge data bank uh, on uh, statistics in uh, European countries. Uh, have a look at our website. It's called the EASY website. Uh, EASY is an acronym for European Agency Statistics on Inclusive Education. And it's totally not easy, uh, I can tell you. It's very complex. Uh, we have there all kinds of uh, interesting data also uh, between countries and, and gender. We have statistics about boy-girl ratio in, in education and so on. Have a good look on, the, on that website. We collaborate a lot with UNESCO, and one of the collaborations we have uh, in the past years is, is a website that gives examples of how inclusive education could look like in action, the, so more lively videos, etc. Um, we organize events, um, uh, hearings, uh, maybe a few words about these hearings. I'm thinking it's coming later, so I skip that for the moment. Um, a lot of events we organize, an international conference and so on. Then um, a few completed one. The first one is the uh, project. The first one is the evidence of relation of, as I said, inclusive education and social inclusion. We just finished a big project on financing. And I might spend some words on financing because uh, not only I'm from the Netherlands, who are usually associated with uh, people who are very knowledgeable about financing issues generally. They bargain, you know, if they go to the market, can they have reduced prices and so on. But also because I think fi financing systems, incentives uh, in legislation, but uh, that people follow money generally. And that one of the explanations for, for big special school systems in some of our countries is because of the financing system. Is that the financing system gives a bonus on segregation in quite a lot of uh, the examples that we have seen. And that the this project shows uh, how this works and also that you should bend the financing system as a bonus to inclusive education and then things will run differently. So financing is one of the main explanations of why we have in a lot of countries big segregated provision. Inclusive early childhood education, we also just finished VAT, we did work on and teacher education for inclusion. 
the last one might some of you know we have developed uh, a profile for the inclusive mainstream teacher a profile that is used in some countries and that describes the skills attitudes uh, views uh, that a teacher should have in order to be an inclusive mainstream teacher of course to to you as uh, students for, for in this faculty and other interested uh, i recommend to look at those um, projects. Currently we are looking into uh, some other work that's ongoing and I can't say much about results because they are running at the moment. We look into teacher professional learning not only in initial training but also continuous professional development and, and uh, further learning. We look into the relation if school failure is related in one way or another to inclusive education. Uh, that's what we do right now. And the changing role of specialist provision in supporting inclusive education. We see in Europe, almost in every country, a debate uh, to change special schools into resource centers, who do much more than taking care of children. Actually, sometimes even no children anymore in this resource center, and uh, assisting mainstream schools, parents, teachers to uh, set up an inclusive education system in the mainstream environment. And um, this is crucial. It, ha it happens in every European country. Uh, how can we go from A to B? And, and this uh, project is giving um, e exchanges between countries how to go about this. Uh, for instance, in Portugal, I, I don't want to give rates to a certain country and say you're doing good and you're doing bad, as I said in the beginning. But Portugal closed down their special schools recently and moved all kids to mainstream schools. And the special schools are now operating as resource centers where they develop materials, give advice, uh, are liaison between different stakeholders and, and so on, and so on, give training. So uh, we have some countries who are in that phase and other countries who have actually a very firm special uh, education segregated provision system where there's hardly any uh, development towards uh, resource centers and they start this process. So there we can learn from each other uh, within our agency. And the role of school leaders of course is crucial in, in every discussion about inclusive education. I always say to teachers, you cannot do it alone. It should be a whole school approach. If it's not the whole school, it won't work. If the head teacher is not on board, it won't work. Okay, um, CPRA, I think I can skip that because I already said that we give countries feedback on, on their uh, policy. Yes, this is a, a brand new activity we do, which is called the Structural Reform Support Service. A, a lot of words. What is it about? We can now, we assist countries now actively in changing their legislation. So we are now currently busy in Poland and Cyprus to look at the current legislation and to move it in a way that is more inclusive. So we are now contracting lawyers in our organization, which is a totally new uh, area of work in our organization. Um, in 19, just now, we have uh, had requests from Greece and Czech Republic also to uh, analyze existing uh, weaknesses in the system and also strength, and to give priority actions advice to them in order to support later on uh, potential legislation, legislative reforms. Now, we can say a lot about EU and bureaucracy and so on, but this is totally non-bureaucratic. This is an immediate assist to countries when they want to change their system uh, and their legislation and say, we need help, and the funding is very uh, uh, easy available. I mean, not easy in, in the sense that, uh, you, of course, you need documentation, but it's it's far from bureaucratic. It's flexible, quick, and, and effective. The easy data, we have, uh, as I said, a lot of data. I can skip this one. The Inclusive Education website I mentioned. 
So uh, this speaks for itself. We have a website with all the projects and, the, and uh, country information. You want to know more about how the system works in the Netherlands, you go to the Netherlands and you find all the information of uh, that country. We do things on YouTube. When we are here now, we are on YouTube uh, and you as well. Uh, so be careful not to put your finger in your nose and so on. I once was at a conference and I saw that my head was uh, immensely big on the back of my uh, self and, I, and then I looked and I s looked my face and I saw one hair. <laughs> Not totally right. Hearings. Yes, uh, what we do is of course uh, trying to listen to all stakeholders in our work. It's not top-down, we know what you should do, we also listen to, to, to learners. We have held four big hearings in the past years where we guarded learners with sometimes very severe disabilities to express their wishes and views and uh, future um, demands to policymakers directly to ministers, to EU officials, to other, to us. And uh, the last one was in Luxembourg. And there is a, of course, you see these are, have all links. If, if you see my PowerPoint later on, if you get it, you can click on the link and then you are forwarded to, these, uh, to this information. But to say a few words about the, um, the outcomes of, of these hearings, I've taken three, there are, there are a few more, but these are the three main messages that we get from the learners. And they say inclusive education is basically a human right discussion. It's not about so much about evidence, uh, it, it's not about other, it is a human right debate. It starts with a mindset that it's everybody's right to belong. And that's their message. And they said, of course, we need teachers who have the skills, competences, and, and resources, and attitudes, but it should be in the inclusive setting. And not only that, also as early as possible, because for ourselves, and our is then the students with sometimes, as I said, very severe disabilities, they also need to learn attitudes, skills, how to deal with things. And they say the earlier the better because then we learn the attitude, skills and knowledge that we need later on in further education, labor market and social life. So uh, to say a few words about our data, uh, we have uh, an in immense data bases uh, which, you can, um, which are split in different uh, levels and of education and, and age and so on. But here I have a slide um, of the last uh, 2016 data set where we have a, an overview of uh, the percentage of learners who are in fully separated settings in our member countries. Um, so the percentage you see is from 6%, which is uh, Slovakia, to almost zero in Croatia, Portugal, um, Norway, Spain, so a huge variation. Hungary is um, somewhere about two and a half percent in segregated provision. And we, we call segregated provision special classes, full-time special classes and special schools because we think that the full-time special class in the mainstream building is still segregation. <coughs> Not all countries are here, uh, but in other data sets more countries appear and depends on the uh, information they have provided us. To add a bit on this, uh, there are more, uh, one other in interesting um, uh, set of the diagram which did not work on, on this system, which is unfortunately, but I can tell you a bit about it, is the n how many learners are officially registered as having special needs. We have a data a basis on that. And there we see a huge variation in Europe. Some countries uh, register almost 20% of their kids as having special needs or additional needs. Others less than one two percent. 
So a huge variation. In uh, Iceland and Scotland, they have a totally different system than in the Netherlands and in any other country. And in Iceland and Scotland, they have a lot of officially registered students with special needs, learners. They are not in those countries in special schools, by the way, but they have a lot of official. Uh, and this variation reflects, of course, not incidents of special needs. It can't, it can't be the case that in Scotland almost 20% have special needs and in Cyprus less than 1%. So that must re be a reflection of something else. That is assessment, diagnostic procedures, but also funding, also financing, how things are being registered in order to get additional resources. But here, this is a striking, I think, a striking uh, table to see that uh, countries have less than half percent and others more than, uh, than six. Um, unfortunately for the Dutch uh, lady in the room, uh, the Netherlands is not on it here, but um, we know that in the Netherlands it is about uh, three percent in uh, segregated provision and then we don't count the children who are in so-called special regular schools. They have this uh, in-between category where children are in specially uh, special schools but it falls under the mainstream legislation so they are counted as being mainstream but it's not totally correct in my view. So the percentage in, in some countries, especially in uh, the area of the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, and so on, is a bit higher than in um, other countries. S yeah. Sorry? Well, Denmark was not on this slide as well, because they have, or they have, yes, Denmark is, is on this slide. It's very high, yes. Uh, and, and that's also a surprise to Denmark, actually. Um, <laughs> the Scandinavian countries were always famous about their uh, inclusive education systems, and uh, actually in Denmark, it, it's in the past decade, it's going this way. A lot of segregation. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a surprise. Yes. Well, there are a few reasons which I try to, uh, to, to put here in this slide. Um, part of the explanation that I've, I've done some statistic work on that is population density. The more people in a, in a relatively small area, the more easy it is to make a special school because it doesn't uh, impact so much on the private life of the family. There's hardly any transport. Uh, he can keep his or her friends, they still live in the neighborhood, and it's easier to set up a special system. Uh, like in the Netherlands, uh, in every big city there is a special school around the corner, so to speak. And, and that's totally different than countries who have a very low population density, like Norway, for instance, or Portugal. Norway is a huge country. I don't know, if, if, you, if you take Norway uh, from the top to to down, and you put Norway upside down, which they won't like, but you turn Norway down to Europe, they end up in Italy. You can't understand, we have no imagination how tall, how long that country is. So if you put Norway like this, you keep your finger in the south, and you turn Norway down, you end up in the middle of Italy. That means that the Norwegian school, somewhere in a rural area, had to cope with disabilities. There was no other option. There was no special school. There was no. So they had to. The same in other countries with low population density. While in the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, Germany, France, the, the, the population density is much higher. So that's one. The second one is uh, funding. If you fund if you finance a special school based on the number of children they have, and if, if teachers depend on the number of special uh, children they have, there is an attractive um, way of getting more, it does attract more kids, because every organization wants to maintain itself, right? As a starting point. There are hardly organizations, not even us, who say, oh, in our dream world, we do not exist anymore. Every organization wants to maintain its 
business. And in some countries, this is, uh, in some areas in countries, and in some countries, this is the, the current strategy, is to have a funding system that is based on needs. And the more needs, the more funds. And uh, the more funds, the more teachers, and the stronger the organization, and so on. So that's what we called input funding. You base your finance model on needs. There was in, the, in, in my country, in the Netherlands, a period that um, if you had a study room in your house, you get tax deduction. That was, uh, the government said, if you have a study room, you have tax deduction. Suddenly, the whole Netherlands families all had a study room. <laughs> of course. And then you had to show that you worked from home long, more than three days. And then a lot of people worked from home three days. People follow money, programs follow money, organizations follow money, and the same is in, in, in education and schools and so on. So one of the examples we have learned is some countries are considering pupil-bound budget to give money to the child or to the parents. Uh, what's called the backpack system, for instance, or the pupil-bound budget. What happens, what do we see in, in some of our member countries? Parents who know the way to get more money in the backpack get more money than parents who don't know the way. Schools want children with a lot of money in the backpack, but with no problems, right? And you see a social division that, it, uh, that the higher socioeconomic status parents are more easy to get things done than parents from a lower socioeconomic status. So actually it reinforces things that we don't want, right? So this backpack system is, an, is a system that attracts, and I think in the, in, in the Netherlands they are now thinking of are we doing it in the right way and should we not change this? Actually they are, they are thinking of, of restructuring it. Also in Austria they had the pupil bound budget and they have found the same problem. Then some more in classrooms or in schools organization some uh, comments. Um, I'm I think I'm almost to the end of my speech so we sh should shortly have some time for questions. Um, if you have a very selective school system with, for instance, homogeneous grouping, uh, everybody should learn the same at the same moment at the same time of the day, etc. You create your failure. You schools, organizations create their own group of students who are f who fail. Also, students who get who are bored. If you all have to to learn the same word in the same week of the year, the word tree, in, in, in when you are six. There are children who already know that for because of their parents' home situation, there are student learners who don't are not there yet. So you, what happens if you say we put you all through the same homogeneous model of education, you create your failures and your students who, who are bored? And both give baby behavioral issues. I, I, can, I can assure you on that, and sh you sure have seen that also. Also, if you have different teaching training tracks, like special teachers who have more salary and have different positions and uh, can earn more when they work in special schools, that, that has an effect on the system. Um, so if these are the attitudes that a child needs very special treatment, all children, and, and in my view, we all need very special treatment. We are all different. I have my special needs, and I'm sure you have your special needs. If you think that that should go into a specialist provision and need special treatment for all of us, then we, you go to a system that is not workable anymore. Um, there are countries who were considering special schools for the talented and gifted, for children with dyslexia, for autism, for PDD NOS, for go on and on and on and on. Then you end up with a school system that has 25 different categories and different labels and so on. And that is not the way education should go forward. The question is, how do we cope with diversity in the classroom? And that's a school organizational question. It's not a, only a classroom question, it is a curriculum question. Uh, uh, 
school organization question and teacher training issue. Uh, uh, the last one is maybe the most important one. Um, so, to almost sum up funding, we need to think about how to change this input funding into funding that facilitates and stimulates inclusive practices. That is a key for a future change. Then teachers should be prepared to deal with diversity in education. That should be a topic in, in, in every training uh, situation, every institute for higher education, university. How do we do this? What can we do to make it more inclusive? And then, as I said, the European average uh, differences are huge in terms of uh, how many children are segregated in, in education. And across Europe, it's 2% average, which doesn't say much because what the do averages say, but it doesn't go down. Although all have ratified the UN Convention, all have uh, in, are in alignment, but that these are policy makers. So it's not about few uh, policy so much anymore, it's now about implementation. That's where the challenge lies. So to conclude, inclusion is a human right. Belonging is key. Belonging, I, I haven't spent much words to it, but if you belong, you feel better. You learn better, and your, uh, your, your uh, self-being, your well-being is, is better. If you don't belong, you have a, an issue because you want to belong. Heterogeneous grouping is the only way forward. If the more homogeneous classrooms we have, the more issues we will see long term with children who fail. Finance inclusion and not segregation. To special education schools I say you do a good job, but at the wrong place. Uh, bring services to the child in his classroom and not child to the services. It, it, it's a very easy sentence and easy to say, but you will maybe remember 10% of what I've said. But these last few, please remember those, because those are key. It's a if you have a headache, you don't want an operation in a hospital. You want a good talk with, uh, with, the, with your doctor first or with your family, right? If you have a headache, you don't want big medicine directly. You, 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 you don't, want, you don't want, want long waiting lists. You want to be helped in your house. You don't want to need to travel. Health is very, if you think about what, what good health is, is the same as what good education is, also what good special education is. You want it as close by, short as possible, light, not fixed. So you want it to be flexible. If A doesn't work, try B. Uh, you want it uh, cheap. You don't want to spend much money on it. If you look at all these criteria for health, and you look at the special education school system, it's the opposite. It's expensive, it's long, your waiting list, uh, you stay there forever, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very simple uh, comparison. So we believe that inclusive education does, at the end, lead to more democratic and fair societies because we are used to have differences in our environment. We, we get tolerance, we learn from each other, and as you can see, I'm quite passionate about this, but inclusive education is also about passion because it's about human rights. I'm here the speaker, but I don't feel myself more as you. We are equal and all different. And that's something we should celebrate and not try to categorize. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was very, very interesting. I just have one question about the data and about the data collection. 
because you told learners or pupils, but uh, do we talk about pupils with multiple disabilities or not? Because we have a healthcare, the education, and the social system. So some of the countries, maybe the pupils with multiple disabilities doesn't belong to the educational system. So the percentage can change because in Hungary, we hope, or we think, we would like, pupils with multiple disabilities belongs to the educational field, not to the healthcare or the social system. So maybe the data can be different. Thank you. Thank you for your very intelligent question, I have to say. Um, one of the challenges that we see in our data and in everybody's data is out of school children. Uh, not only because of certain types of disabilities, but also because in some countries there are just a lot of children not going to education. So we have, um, in the past year, started with our data experts a debate about the out of school children situation. And in our latest data, we have um, presented tables where we just present how many children in our member countries go to an inclusive education system. And the rest is either in the segregated provision or not in education at all. So there are tables included in our data. You can find them easily, and it's one of the first set of tables in our 2018 data set. Thank you for your question. Thank you. I'm a primary school <coughs> a student for a primary school teaching in the Netherlands. And you can speak Dutch. Then. <laughs> but then it would be harder for, for all the oh other yeah, people to understand that's it. And we would have an amazing conversation, but for the rest of the people it would be hard to understand. But I'm already really difficult for me to implement the different levels for the students that I have in my normal classes. I'm already teaching at three, maybe four or five different skill levels. How would you suggest to do that with even more different people with harder disabilities that it's even more difficult to differentiate on all the proper levels for all the special needs in the children. And I think it's really impossible to do that alone in your classroom. OK. Um, one compliment uh, before I, I give your answer. I think one of the uh, agreements we should make is not to go from all these percentages to zero. That's, that's not something which is feasible. Uh, it's, I know a situation where it's totally zero. New Brunswick, Canada, for instance, they uh, include all children, also those who need medical treatment during the day. If you ever had, have the opportunity to go to New Brunswick, you will see some examples where you think, what is this? Why do they have these children lying in bed in the classroom? But then we talk to parents, and parents say, since this child is, is in this normal classroom, it's the first time, compared to the institution that this ch these children were before, it's the first time we communicate. There's a start of communication, which has never happened before. And then parents could say, well, why should my child suffer under the circumstances of having children with this type of disability in the classroom? All the attention goes there, and my child doesn't get the attention. There are a few things that I that my response will be. One of them is peer tutoring. Is a, I don't know if you use that in your classroom, but students can learn from each other. And that's a, it, all the research says that's a very effective way of working. If a teacher cannot do everything, students can learn from each other. And that should be a mixed uh, type of system. There are numerous examples in literature how this should be set up. I don't want to go in detail, but peer tutoring is a fantastic tool. Now. Answering your questions, and, and my compliment is this. If you start uh, starting reading, for instance, and you build in different levels of uh, entrance, and uh, that's already, especially in the countries as, as we live in, you and I, that's a trick that is already solving a lot of issues. And, and uh, in, if the Netherlands uh, and Belgium and those countries go from, say, 4 or 5% back to 2% already, we have gained a lot because that, that's what we are talking about. And most of the children 
in those countries have just learning difficulties. They are half a year behind or a few months and then the teacher goes to the, to the service, to the support center, I have this child who is half a year behind and it doesn't work. I hope I gave a bit of a reply. Thank you. Um, you need a microphone because others would like to hear you. So maybe my question is a bit related to the previous it's, it's question. It's not on, I think. So it's on. Oh, it's on. Okay, so maybe my uh, question is a bit related to the previous question, but you had some words about how Portugal closed special schools. And uh, my question is, uh, in which way uh, the uh, children with special needs are helped out in the mainstream schools after the replacement? And uh, my other question is, uh, where uh, the special education uh, teachers uh, are placed in the system after the special schools are closed? Well, I, I don't know the details in Portugal, but I know a few things that, that uh, helps you. What they did in Portugal is, uh, what was on one of my last remarks, bring the services to the child. So the teachers were not fired. They got a different different thing to do. They support, I'm uh, sorry? Yeah, I guess, I, I'm just, I just don't know how it works after or. Yeah, well, the ch they still have, every country has challenges, also Portugal. We, we, Inclusion is an endless fight. It's the same, it's a non-ending process. The same as inequalities between men and women. It's the same as poverty. Uh, you will not get rid of poverty. We will not get, I hope, we will get rid of men, women inequalities in, in whatever, in salary, in positions, etc. And we should always continue to, to fight this. So inclusion will never be a full, inclusive Europe. That will not happen. But you need this focal point, and you need to fight for it. And in Portugal, they have changed the legislation. They had debates with all the stakeholders involved, parents, learners. Uh, Portugal is also very active to listen to the learners where it is about, teachers. And they, yeah, I must admit, it, it has to do with also with parental attitudes. In Portugal, there is a strong society uh, view that children should be in mainstream schools with their peers. While in other countries, we love to have a child with a label, because then it's not a problem of us anymore. It is labeled, diagnosed, and we know, OK, set a uh, special school. I mean, it, it's a way of thinking. It's mindset. And in Portugal, I think the mindset is in various groups of stakeholders totally focused on togetherness, belonging democratic, uh, coping with diversity, celebrate differences. Those are things that, uh, and in other countries, this is not uh, always the case. So they had an advantage. But I, I don't think that teachers lost their job. Uh, that's, I've, I've talked a lot to uh, Portuguese uh, colleagues. In, uh, they just moved and had to change their attitude, not focusing on children, but on empowerment of mainstream provision. You have to empower and learn the teachers to cope with diversity. And their examples, as in New Brunswick, shows this is not something very complex. For the majority of children in special schools, it is totally not a complex issue. It is just a matter of mindset. You don't seem to believe me, but OK, we can say <laughs> I do. <laughs> Um, my question is about another level of education, which is higher education. So do you have any experience or data that uh, how can higher education deal with the compensatory system and, uh, and actually all the obstacles that comes from mainstream education? So it is very hard and very low percentage of youngsters can get into to higher education because of the mainstream education is like not very inclusive. So the question is, like, what can higher education do in this field? Yeah. Uh, a few um, different comments that I would like to make to this question. Uh, if you look at inclusive education, then it seems that in primary school level, 
things can be done in a relatively easy way. In secondary school, it gets more difficult already because you have subject teachers. Teachers have, um, give math for three hours and then they have the group and they go. There's no shared responsibility of a group of kids or learners. It is your individual classroom and your individual subject and then they go. I've seen uh, some examples in Sweden where they have changed this setting uh, in secondary school where they say, okay, you have a home, that's what they call the home class system. The students stay in their, in their classroom and the teachers come in. So that's one. You have your own environment. They can bring their own uh, pictures from home and have them on the wall from their animals or pets or whatever. And then the group of secondary education teachers have said, okay, let's make a group of four, five teachers. Those are the only ones who give the, uh, the lessons. So one teacher covers science uh, and, and uh, math and, and so on, more the, and the other maybe two or three languages. And then, so only four or five teachers who, and they are responsible for the whole group. And there you see that they say, there's something wrong with this child, we should have a look. D they feel responsible because, the, and that's where we're talking about, how responsible do you feel for the learners you have in your classroom? And it's in secondary education, there are some, um, as I said, in, uh, some innovations going on here. On higher education, we have not much information. What happens in higher education? It is the autonomy. Uh, the uh, institutes for higher education and universities have autonomy to do things what they want, basically. Well, I see a no, but in uh, overlooking all the uh, there is not a strict, you should do this, this, and th there are, of course, requirements. There's a lot of quality control. There's a lot of things you should uh, show and, and uh, how quick students come and leave again, and now, etc. But in terms of accessibility and in terms of special arrangements, uh, universities have their own policy. But there, we see a lot of improvements here actually going on in universities and institutes for higher education to make a policy on accessibility, not only of buildings, but also of material, of information. And we did a work on, uh, we did some work on ICT for inclusion uh, and then drafted guidelines for institutions, organizations to be in, in accessible in terms of information. And those are on three levels, on what everybody should do, on advanced and on expert level. And uh, then we are talking how easy accessible is the curriculum and the, and the information in, in studying and so on and so forth. Because uh, I don't know, there was a, and here I get some passion I feel, but there was a period, I don't know how it is in your country, that in my country children who are six and were blind had to go uh, with a train on Monday morning and go to a boarding school till Friday and came home in the weekend. They were away for a whole week and they were five, six years old. That was in my country the normal situation. When the devices came, Brian and all the others, we said, can't we move them back into mainstream, can't we set up a system in mainstream in schools? Who were against it? What do you think? Parents? No. The schools for special education who catered for, they said, this will go wrong. This is stupid. You will lose all the knowledge. If you take that example, which is also for physical handicap, what is, what is wrong with the wheelchair in the classroom? Come on. What's, there were situations in countries where that, if you had a wheelchair, you go somewhere else. Why? Were we crazy? Thank you. <laughs>